what I want to do is give you a little tour through, I, went, 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 I looked for a photo of Thibault with Virginie Lantre performing and I couldn't find one. I could have given you an audio recording, but without the permission of the artists, I didn't think that would be appropriate. So maybe at some other time. Um, but now let me give you a little bit of a tour about where we're going in the future. We've, we've heard um, in the previous few talks, how the theory um, led to, and then from Alessandra, a little snippet of the results from the LIGO and Virgo observations. Where are we going in the future? I'm actually going to be a bit ambitious and uh, stretch a bit beyond um, the um, just the, uh, the interferometers on the ground and give you a, a more complete vision. Um, so here is a uh, plot of gravitational wave strain on the vertical uh, axis and frequency over an absolutely enormous range, of course, from once per universe to once per millisecond. Um, and a variety of different techniques that are used to look in these different frequency domains. And I'll walk through them. I think I'll have to note also that my knowledge also progresses from negligible at these frequencies to rather deep at this range of frequencies. And so you'll see a change in the way I present as I go forward. But the first thing I want to talk about a bit is the, the use of the cosmic microwave background as a probe for looking at primordial gravitational waves. It clearly is the holy grail um, to be able to see the first moments of the universe via gravitational waves. It's probably the only way we can get as early a glimpse as we would love to see. And probably looking at the influence of those initial primordial gravitational waves on the cosmic microwave background is the best handle that we have on it. We could imagine building a special purpose, say space-based detector, um, focused on a 0.1 hertz frequency when there might be a minimum of static from other gravitational wave sources where we may be able to actually see a, a directly a cosmic microwave, uh, I'm sorry, a, a cosmic gravitational wave background. But for now, this is the best thing to look at. And the measure of success that this, uh, this attempt uses is to look at the tensor to scalar ratio in the uh, in the background, looking if you're looking at the curl or the B uh, B modes um, in, in their relation to the uh, electric field modes, and there was just a recent uh, um, paper on this from Bicep Keck W Map Plunk, um, which put a somewhat better limit on the value of this tensor to scalar ratio of an R, that ratio, of 0 0.036. Um, they've been inching down or centimetering down as time goes by. Um, here's a map actually of the B mode spectrum at the frequency 95 gigahertz, which has the least uh, foreground dust to uh, distract. That however is a really big problem for this method of detection. And of course there was one um, confused notion that maybe something had been seen when in fact it was nothing but dust. Here's the sad truth. This ratio scales, um, at least in some theory or another, uh, at the fourth power of the energy of the scale of inflation. And so while um, to explore a broad range of energies is probably impossible because R scales so quickly, happily it looks like some of the cherished theories can be reached even within the range that's feasible. So where's the future on this particular um, approach to looking at gravitational waves? It's probably CMBS4. It's a ground-based cosmic microwave background experiment consisting of 21 telescopes, um, some at the South Pole and some in the Chilean Atacama Desert. Um, Multi-band detectors are used to be able to better remove that contamination from the galactic foregrounds. It's a U.S. thing with the Department of Energy and the NSF as the funding agencies. Um, it's um, going to be commissioned during this decade, and then seven years of operations are planned through the 2030s. And it should give about a 10 times improvement in sensitivity over the best numbers to date. Here's a plot of the tensor to scalar ratio R on the vertical axis over a range of spectral indices for different models of the um, of this cosmic microwave background. And you can see the, the current models, uh, sorry, the current measurements are up around 0 .0, 0 0.03 here. And the CMB S4 targets to get down a, a factor of 10 or more. 
the sensitivity that's planned ensures that a non-detection of R would rule out leading inflationary models and motivate alternative models for the origin of the universe. If in fact um, R is truly greater than 0.003, it's expected that a measurement could be made at five sigma. That would be convincing. If nothing is seen, um, then it sets R down another uh, factor of five or thereabouts. So this is a very exciting uh, place to look. Clearly there'd be, I'd say perhaps nothing more revolutionary than seeing traces of this primordial gravitational wave background. So I'm now gonna move up in frequency. I've got another plot here of strain versus frequency where I've trimmed off the cosmic microwave background. And now we'll talk a bit about um, using pulsar timing arrays to look at the frequency range from oh, something like 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus six Hertz. What's the basic notion? Um, well, first off the prime target is a stochastic background signal um, from cosmological sources. It's very unlikely that in, those, in this frequency range um, that a primordial background would dominate over a cos a, an astrophysical background. It may also be possible to use this approach to see some supermassive black hole binary in spirals as individual sources. That would require some luck, but there may be some there. And the technique is to observe well-characterized millisecond pulsars. Uh, here's, here's one here. Um, it's radiating uh, radio waves uh, due to its magnetic field. It's spun up due to the accretion that formed the neutron star. Um, that's seen as a highly periodic signal by a radio telescope. Um, using techniques to um, add signals together, remove the dispersion, um, you can come up with an extremely accurate measurement of the time of arrival of the clock ticks here. The thing is that as the gravitational wave passes, um, the apparent distance between us and that uh, clock will change. And that would lead to a shift in the arrival of the clock ticks that could be due to a passing gravitational wave. It does require a search for and a very deep understanding of very stable pulsars. Where are we going with this particular search? The most recent pulsar timing results are from Nanograv's analysis. Um, again, it's a US outfit that's leading. I hope it doesn't sound too nationalistic. I'll be mostly talking about US activities here. Uh, their recent analysis of 12.5 years of precision timing data from 47 pulsars. Um, they see a strong evidence for some kind of red noise process, some color in the noise spectrum that's seen. However, it's not correlated spatially. Um, Hellings and Downs demonstrated that for a gravita gravitational wave due to the quadrupolar form, that you expect to see um, uh, on the sky a distribution of correlation, which is characteristic, and that's not there yet. So, so far, they could either be seeing the first it's of evidence of a true signal, or they just may be looking at noisy pulsars. They're already constraining galaxy formation with the level of sensitivity. There's antennas are, uh, they really, uh, there are two pieces to this, of course. There's understanding the pulsars, which is a, requires a lot of detailed understanding of, the, of, the, of those strange objects. But then there's also the need for a very good, very sensitive radio telescopes distributed around the earth. Um, Arecibo was the really the prime source of data for nanograv. And uh, one can't say Arecibo without thinking of Thibault, of course, and the way that he used the data from that and the observations by Holst Taylor and others um, to put really remarkable constraints on uh, theories of uh, relativity. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that as we go forward in this meeting. Meanwhile, back to pulsar timing arrays for gravitational waves, uh, we do have the new Chinese radio antenna, which is um, coming online and looks like we'll share data. Chime up in uh, British Columbia will also be a source. SKA will come online in a while. The teams working on this think that they can see a factor of 10 improvement in the next 10 years. Uh, this is some kind of graphical representation of that over, this is years on the horizontal scale and and a measure of the amplitude sensitivity on the vertical scale. And their notion is that they can push down by about a factor of 10 by 2030. And this team is, uh, the team's working on pulsar timing, not only the US team, but the International Pulsar Timing Array. 
uh, folks in Australia, Michael Kramer in, in uh, Germany and in Europe in general, all believe they can pull together an international pulse or timing array analysis, which will make a detection in the coming years. And my guess is that this will be the next method um, and domain that will show a gravitational wave signal. So let's move up one more step in frequency um, from 10 to the minus four Hertz to about 0 0.1 Hertz. Um, Space-based interferometric measurements are the ones that look like the best approach. So this notion of using space-based inter interferometers as a means of detecting gravitational waves um, dates from 1974, which is just a couple of years after Ray Weiss's uh, groundbreaking um, analysis that made it look like, in 1972, that made it look like ground-based interferometry had some ghost of a chance of working. Ray Weiss and Peter Bender were having dinner, and um, in those days, one used napkin technology as a way of noting what was uh, going to be planned. And the basic notion is that as a gravitational wave passes this array of uh, free-floating satellites, um, for one phase of the gravitational wave, this arm length would be stretched and these two would be slightly shrunken. And of course the converse for the other half of a periodic a gravitational wave. And it's basically a timing measurement between test masses in space where these test masses are exquisitely isolated from external forces, not only by being very far from the earth and uh, that bothersome plan planetoid, the moon, but also inside a shield satellite, which is slaved to follow the free floating test mass, protecting it from solar wind and micrometeorites and so forth and so on. One can take advantage of the vacuum in space to make very long arms. Um, the signal that we perceive a delta L, a change in length is proportional to the gravitational wave strain H times the length of the arms L. In space, one can imagine making arms of, um, say, a million, uh, or I'm sorry, a billion meters, a million kilometers. Um, this can lead to, for sensible gravitational wave signals, which you could hope to see frequently, a delta L of some 10 to the minus 11 meters. Uh, notice that that's actually a much more generous motion than what the ground-based interferometers have to deal with because of their much shorter arms. There are other challenges in putting things up in space. A triangular configuration is used. Um, this has a, a few advantages. Sums and differences are taken around the loop in both directions. All three arms, all six lengths are instrumented. Um, that allows both polarizations of gravitational waves to be measured, provides signals to remove the laser frequency noise, um, and generation also of a null stream for a test of, uh, of, uh, of the noise performance. The Earth trailing orbit, um, here demonstrated, here's the sun, um, this triangle this cartwheels around uh, the sun at one astronomical unit, making a scan of space and allowing long lived sources to be looked at from various different perspectives, improving the ability to do localization. The status of Lisa. The projected science capabilities are truly breathtaking. Uh, the mapping of supermassive black holes by intermediate mass, tiny test particles, understanding galaxy formation, uh, unprecedented tests of general relativity um, where the TBOS waveforms will have to be pushed to ever higher precision. It, this uh, is a snapshot from the proposal to ESA for the LISA mission, which in, tries to encapsulate the range of things that can be shown here. I won't spend much time with it. Once again, it's strain versus frequency. Here are the arcs of the path of several different scales of supermassive black holes. Um, here are some sources which can be seen both in space and on the ground. Um, here is a huge number of uh, white dwarfs which will form a static background, but which can be regressed out in some measure. The key freefall technology of LISA was beautifully demonstrated by LISA Pathfinder um, the telescope is the principal untested instrument of development element, but we think we know how to build telescopes now, 30 centimeters in diameter, it's modest. There are lots of systems challenges, but in fact, you know, it's not so easy to build three satellites with six transponders and get them all into space and get them to work. Um, so a lot of it is pretty practical, a matter of making a space mission go. This is an ESA-L mission with broad European member state participation, 
NASA as a junior partner. Um, the mission formulation review is underway. We're on track for a 2025 adoption, a mid-2030s launch, a start to observe in late 2030s at, with a four-year uh, guaranteed mission and 10-year consumables. So this is something that I'm looking forward to. I'm going to eat carefully and exercise to make sure I'm around for it when it's actually observing. So let's move on to the last domain of frequency space from about a couple of hertz up to maybe a couple of kilohertz where the ground-based interferometric detectors are the ones that are the best choice. There are three epochs relevant for this future discussion. One is building out the network of current advanced detectors, then a full exploitation of the, of the present observatories, three and four kilometer observatories, and then comes the next generation instruments in new observatories. Ollie mentioned binary reach to neutron stars a couple of times as a way to indicate sensitivities. Obviously, there's a wide range of GR, astrophysics, and cosmology that can be explored. We'd love to see, say, cosmic strings. Um, I mostly want to see things that, that are guaranteed sources from the fact that they appear as in high signal to noise ratio in multiple detectors and for which there is no obvious um, explanation. That's what I really want to see. But let me talk a bit about building out the network. This is a, a pictorial representation of where the ground-based detectors currently stand. We have advanced LIGO, Hanford, and Livingston that came on around 2015. I had the pleasure to lead the project that led to these instruments. What a, what a, what a team, uh, what, what a nice result. Um, Advanced Virgo came on a year later. They got started a couple of years later, um, but quickly caught up. And of course, Virgo and LIGO have been observing together and um, have shown that what really matters is the network. Individual detectors are cool. You need a, a network if you want to do science. Kagra, um, which is a very ambitious technically um, project in Japan, um, has already observed, although at a rather low sensitivity or Poor sense to you have to say. And I think they still have a number of years to go because they were ambitious about picking up some technologies that will certainly be useful for future detectors, building underground, using cryogenics, using a different wavelength of light, using a different test mass material. There are a lot of commissioning challenges to bring the, uh, this instrument to its full astrophysical sensitivity. Then there's LIGO India. Um, when we built advanced LIGO, we built actually three detectors and put one in boxes. And LIGO India is an India government funded project to build an infrastructure that can receive this third detector. And when it is installed, uh, probably in the mid to late 2020s, it will come online with the same configuration and we expect the same sensitivity as the LIGO detectors. And so by the end of this um, decade, we should have an incredibly broad and robust uh, high sensitivity network of ground-based interferometers in the current observatories. What can we do in a four kilometer infrastructure? Well, LIGO and Virgo, as I said, will continue to interleave observing and improving the sensitivity until the next generation of detectors in place. Maybe we can keep on observing if there's a good enough scientific reason and we can get enough money from the, the funding agencies to keep the infrastructure going. Using LIGO as an example, in the near term, to sort of 2028, we have a well-defined program leading to about a 20 times greater event rate. Um, that comes from about a 2.7 times a better signal to noise ratio for a given event. We get to cube this, of course, to know what the rate is because the volume of the sphere with which we can reach grows as the cube. This is a pictorial representation of the evolution of frequency strain on the vertical axis, frequency in the horizontal axis, and now we're talking about audio frequencies, where we can see the progression through the various observing runs already executed, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0.01, and then heading into 04, which we expect to start about a year from now, and with a somewhat better sensitivity than the previous um, run. And then the ultimate sensitivity of the detectors, which are currently installed in LIGO, and we expect to see in, in LIGO India, comparable for Virgo, of, of something like a reach to 330 megaparsecs for neutron star binaries. On the longer term, in the four kilometer infrastructure, we can make a bit more progress. We're just starting to think about what's possible and what's practical. 
it looks like improvements of about another factor of two in sensitivity or eight in rate will be feasible. And this is a little map um, of doing some modeling. The current um, A plus that's installed, we can see probably to about 340 megaparsecs for binary neutron stars when it's fully commissioned. That is, by the way, for binary black holes, a greater reach of about 2.5 um, gigaparsecs. A++, which we um, think we know how to build, um, but would not be too ambitious, would be, give a mild increase. We can either change the kind of coatings that we use or perhaps install some mild cryogenics and get even further out. So there's still some future in the current observatories and one which we hope will bridge to beyond the four kilometer infrastructure. Just want to show a sky map with that five detector array and the kinds of sensitivities we expect to have toward the end of this, um, this decade, we can expect to see better than square, 10 square degrees of localization over most all of the sky. It will be great for doing multi-messenger astrophysics. So what's after that? Next generation observatories is something that's gotten a great deal of work over the last decade and is now starting to take on an aura of reality. First, let me say a bit about the European concept, the Einstein telescope. Um, there's been a significant study design, under study, design study undertaken for both facilities and instruments. Underground construction is proposed to reduce the Newtonian background. Of course, we can do a good job with engineering of reducing the stray forces which are applied mechanically to the test masses, but the time varying Newtonian attraction of the test mass due to the fact that the density of material around the test mass is changing from seismic waves or from people walking nearby um, is, is a very difficult and in fact, ultimately irreducible limit to how low in frequency one can go on the ground. If you go underground, um, th that seismic noise is reduced and it reduces that Newtonian background. It's also nice because if it's underground, it doesn't uh, keep the cows from roaming on the surface of the, of the earth in Europe. It, a triangular format is proposed, um, which is shown in this really fantastic uh, rendering here of about a 10 kilometer long arm. Um, this triangular uh, system allows again, um, multiple instruments in a xylophone configuration um, to look at different frequency ranges because of the three interferometers, uh, one localized at each one of the corners here and one site polarization is possible. The polarization measurement is possible. It's also designed to accommodate a range of topologies for future growth. There's really big news that took place this summer. It was, uh, this was placed on the European, oh, what in the world does this stand for? It's, it is a roadmap of the research infrastructures of the largest scale in Europe. And this uh, project was placed on that roadmap, which gives it a high likelihood of funding uh, in the long term. It's a really wonderful thing. I can't help but show this computer generated rendering of what the underground facility might look like. And I, you have to realize the size scale here. I don't know if you can make out on your screen this human. It's an absolutely enormous, magnificent cavern that will be dug to house the detector. In the US, there's also a concept for a next generation detector. This approach is actually more brute force, so make it more American. Um, the notion is to make advanced LIGO some 10 times longer, um, and that will lead to a 10 times greater sensitivity. Thermal noise, radiation pressure, seismic noise, Newtonian um, noise background are all unchanged as forces on the test mass, but the signal grows with length. Once again, L, a larger L leads to a larger delta L, and this is the measurable for us in our interferometry. That's true, of course, up to the point where the wavelengths are shorter than the arms, half wavelength is the optimal. Um, and you could note that a 20 kilometer long antenna is ideal for looking at the neutron star, neutron star tidal signal detection, which would happen at a few kilohertz. Um, this gives you a sense of the scale that we're talking about. Here's a sketch of the four kilometer LIGO facility. And that's what it looks like against the 40 kilometer arms of the uh, Cosmic Explorer concept. In fact, Cosmic Explorer consists of two sites, 40 kilometers and 20 kilometers. It's on the Earth's surface. 
we look for something which is truly flat, which we would call a bowl, but there would still be some earth moving involved. 40 kilometers is ideal for the reaching the maximum distance to increase the, the reach of um, to larger and larger black hole and black hole distances. This concept offers sensitivity without new measurement challenges. We can start at room temperature, modest laser power, and so forth and so on. There's a recently completed cosmic explorer horizon study, um, which um, brings together and um, re refines a lot of the ideas for this concept. I would say that the, the group in the US is eager to catch up with Einstein Telescope, which is clearly much more uh, uh, refined and also further along in identifying a path to funding. Here's uh, a, a notion of what the corner station might look like with the tubes hitting off into the horizon. So what can you do with these new instruments? Um, one more time, here is a plot of strain noise versus frequency over sort of a few Hertz up to a few kilohertz. Um, for the present LIGO and Virgo sensitivities are up here somewhere. The best that we can do in the four kilometer and three kilometer installations of LIGO and Virgo were sketched out here. And then these next generation instruments with their longer baselines allow this very significant, roughly a factor of 10 step forward in terms of the sensitivities that can be achieved. A different and probably more informative way of looking at the sensitivity of these detectors is given in looking at a plot of redshift versus total source frame mass, where again, the current detectors are down here. You can see these new detectors can reach out to the almost inconceivable notion of a redshift of 100. This donut plot gives a visual representation of that. I won't talk through it in detail, but for both, um, binary black holes and for neutron stars, it's expected that these next generation observatories, Cosmic Explorer and Einstein Telescope, should be able to see to the edge of the population of, those, of the binaries that could be formed from those objects. When could this new wave of ground instruments come into play? Looks like 15 years is about what it takes based on LIGO and Virgo experience. If the funding holds up, Einstein Telescope could be observing in the early 2030s and Cosmic Explorer in the mid 2030s. We should hope and strive and plan to have the great instruments ready to catch the end phase of binary seen in LISA. Uh, it looks like the timing is not impossible. What's crucial for all these endeavors is to grow the scientific community planned on exploiting these instruments far beyond general relativity and gravitational wave um, affectionati. And the, this is because the costs are like the giant telescopes on the ground, billions of accounting units. So my last page. There are wonderful gravitational weave science opportunities within the reach of technology. Um, let's hope and conspire to cause our funding agencies to, to support these initiatives. Um, and then I didn't say an awful lot about Thibault's contributions because others will certainly, but I do wanna say thanks to Thibault for contributing in so many ways. Um, this is uh, the two of us in casual attire at a, at a dinner uh, event that we had the pleasure to attend up in Stockholm. Uh, maybe we'll have other reasons to get up there and put on a tuxedo. Thank you very much. Uh, what are the prospects of observing at still higher frequency a few kilohertz, five kilohertz, uh, with a detector which will be tuned uh, to observe the merger and uh, post-merger of two neutron stars, because there is a lot of physics uh, associated with uh, uh, nuclear matter inside neutron stars and to be compared with gamma ray burst model uh, and, and so on. Mm. Mm. Yes, it's, it, it's a challenge. It certainly is a challenge for the interferometric detectors as they're currently made to have a very high sensitivity up at those high frequencies. And there are a few approaches that are being studied, um, simply increasing the laser power very significantly, of, um, even if one's doing a good job of using prepared states of light, squeezing and so forth, um, that creates noise at low frequencies, but it can increase the, the sensitivity at high frequencies if we can manage the technical limitations due to absorption in the test mass substrates and coatings. Also, there's the question of the dynamics of the test mass of the, the photon pressure is really formidable once you get up to megawatts of power. But between those approaches and also um, using um, detuned interferometers that 
concentrate their sensitivity there. We think that with these um, new interferometers, these uh, long baseline interferometers and the kinds of technology we'll have in the mid thirties, we have a good chance were we to see, for instance, another neutron star, neutron star binary at the same distance of the very well studied uh, GW, um, well, the, the, the binary neutron star that we saw in 2017, it would, should be possible for us to study in detail that coalescence and be able to extract from it parameters about the, the neutron star material. Uh, perhaps others will say more about that in, in later in the in the meeting, but we think we have technologies that we can develop to the point where we can make that measurement. Thank you. Other questions? No. Uh, Jean-Pierre. Uh, hi, David. Hello. I, I would like to make a prediction that I won't be around to, to verify, but I bet that the cosmic explorer will be observing 10 years before the Einstein telescope. <laughs> I hope I hope and pray that is not the case. Um, I hope they both um, exceed our expectations for when they come online. And I think what, one of the things that the ground-based um, instrument building community needs to do is make sure that we work as a team so that we get these new detectors online as quickly as we possibly can and have the proper network. So I, 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 I'll, I'll bet against you. We can make a dollar no, bet the, or a euro bet if you prefer. David, the reason is very simple. As usual, Americans chose something simple and Europeans have chosen something so complicated it will never work like it's to do it. <laughs> we see. And hopefully, it, we see. <laughs> I, want you, I want you to be proven wrong. <laughs> okay, there is one more question. Coming back to, uh, to the question about the binary, certainly now we know many binary neutron stars, we observe them, uh, and, um, and the observation in, again, in the gel, in the term, they give mass and a lot of details of this system. I wonder what the complementary information could be gained from the gravitational wave. Because we already have a lot of data. Well, I think okay. that it's clear that there, there are things that happen. In, that you can read out the response to the tidal forces in the gravitational wave. And I think it's very likely that the data that can be obtained from that is orthogonal to that which can be seen from the ele electromagnetic radiation. And the two can be put together in a synergistic way to build a more complete model of nuclear matter in those very extreme circumstances. But now we're getting well beyond what I call my, uh, my, my expertise. And I'm sure others in the audience over coffee can give you a richer answer to your question. Indeed, I think this is a very good point to stop and to thank uh, uh, David.